we'll get straight to the point. This video is intended to be a comprehensive review of Shadowversity's modern versus historical archery video, the way it should have been done. I won't be summarizing or making assumptions, I'll be going line by line and looking at the comments in the context they've presented. Note that I haven't watched Shad's video regarding me, since I didn't respond well initially, I doubt I'll do much better with this one, so if there are any new perspectives from the video, I'll miss those. This is going to be a long video, so I've broken into segments with timestamps in the description below, so you can skip to the bits you want. The first section will briefly cover the small details on the bow setup. Uh, this covers things we've already covered before, just talking about the bows actually in the video. Uh, this is not meant to be a criticism, rather it's going to be an expansion of uh, what we're actually seeing. It's mostly technical, so it's here for completeness. Uh, it's worth skipping. The second section will look at what I consider to be the major points of discussion in the presentation, particularly on the historical side. For those who want to understand the drama, the third section will be presenting why I reacted so negatively to Shadowversity, and finally, I'll outline where I'm going from here. As I said before, skip to whatever section you want. I'm going to be looking at the comparative differences between modern day archery and historical archery, and how that by necessity creates certain limitations and also differences in the style or way that it was done. What I feel is most missing from the introduction and the video in general is a clear definition of historical and modern archery. These are somewhat vague and abstract terms and just as how we say martial arts and we assume karate or kung fu, uh, saying historical archery often triggers uh, English archery and modern archery triggers uh, Olympic archery. The bow that you're seeing me hold here would in, by most modern considerations, be considered a more traditional bow because there's quite a lot of differences between this bow and a modern day target recurve. This bow here is what you would kind of find in modern day sport archery and yes, there's a couple of key differences between the two. But even on this more traditional wooden bow, this is not the type of bow that you would find in the medieval period, uh, or even <laughs> for many times after it. I've already done a video covering the use of stand-in bows, uh, I'm not going to cover it again. He does say that these are not historical bows, that's very clear. For those who want to know, the bow on the right is a win-and-win -win target recurve bow from the 2000s. Um, the bow on the left is a traditional recurve bow of a design that was popularized in the 1960s. They actually aren't that different. Uh, this goes into a different misconception um, that modern archery is a world apart from traditional bows or historical bows. And the reality is that they're actually very, very similar in function. Uh, once you remove the sides and stabilizers and other things, you really have the same core design, with the only difference being the material. A minor but somewhat important point is that the Olympic or sport style uh, recurve bows are not solely representative of modern archery. Um, there are many modern bows which aren't target bows or sport bows. Uh, in fact, the uh, main modern bow which people think of is the compound bow, which is exclusively modern. Well, what you'll notice if I hold it up on the side here, it has a, a cutout right here. This is correct. Uh, the cutout section for the center shot is a hallmark of bow designs dating from the 1960s and onwards. This is to solve a thing called the archer's paradox. On a regular bow, its shaft would actually be in the way of the arrow. And when the arrow gets loosed, it actually has a natural curve or oscillation where it curves around the shaft and keeps moving forward. This is correct, and also one of the few times which someone actually mentions the archer's paradox correctly. Uh, the most common misconception is that the paradox is the flexing of the arrow. In this case, Shad is correct. It's to do with the positioning or the apparent positioning of the arrow. This type of design helps reduce the vibration or oscillation that an arrow receives in flight, but it doesn't get rid of it completely. You never will. The center shot cutout by itself doesn't reduce uh, oscillation. Uh, oscillation shouldn't be seen as a bad thing. Um, as long as the arrow is correctly spying for the bow, then it will hit the target and will fly straight. Um, the main thing here is that if the arrow is not correctly spying for the bow, then it will cause a drift. But the oscillation itself isn't going to cause inaccuracy. 
but it certainly helps with accuracy. The main benefit of the center shot is actually to uh, make it much easier to tune. Uh, remember that arrows aren't uniform, uh, different arrows have different spine ratings and so will flex slightly differently depending on the stiffness of the arrow. A stronger bow or heavier bow needs a stiffer arrow whereas a lighter bow needs a softer arrow. Now this customization was not a fine art back in historical times. In fact there are some techniques like the uh, Asiatic Katra uh, which is designed to help improve clearance. The center shot bows don't require as much displacement from the arrow, so you can use a greater variety of spines without causing clearance issues. And this is something which came about due to the demand of modern target archery. So technically, shad isn't wrong. Uh, the center shot cutout does generally improve accuracy, and this is actually seen in the results of modern competition. So even though this bow is considered more traditional uh, on the standard you know, view of recurve bows. So yes, Shad does specify that this is not a proper traditional bow. And to be more specific, it's not a proper historical bow. Um, the word traditional has some different meanings in archery because that is a traditional bow, but it's not an historical design. It is not completely traditional. I put a completely true, you know, traditional longbow is going to have just a single shaft straight all the way down. If you're only talking about English longbow, then yes, uh, that is a perfectly straight stave, um, but not all historical bows uh, were perfectly straight. Uh, there are designs like the uh, European Hormigard bow, uh, there are North American flat bows, uh, quite a few of the Asiatic bows also have some tapering or narrowing of the grip. So it's not significant. Um, what I think he means is that it doesn't have a center shot cutout, which is true. I want to point out a style, okay, an, an, an actual type or archery style that this type of bow almost necessitates and it's the side in which you load your arrow. You can't shoot the modern recurve any other way. Um, there's no place to put the arrow so you have to shoot it on one hand and that's something which I think is actually not mentioned in this particular video is that this specific bow is a right-handed bow. Uh, most modern bows are not ambidextrous, um, they're meant to be used right-handed or left-handed uh, and unfortunately this has caused quite a bit of confusion in the comment section. Now, of course, I could still fire this bow with the arrow on the right side, but it's kind of awkward if I kind of show you. Uh, I've already made a unpopular video talking about the uh, use of these bows, and I'll concede that he does con properly contextualize and say this is not historical, which is fair for Shad. The reason why I picked this up was that I feel that the absence of historical technique on historical bows makes it a bit problematic to understand what's going on. So this design actually makes right-sided archery shooting even more difficult than if it was just a plain shaft. This particular bow, yes. Uh, if you want to shoot from the right side with this kind of bow, then you would use a left-handed bow. Just to interject here, uh, Shad doesn't mention that he's a right-handed shooter. This should be obvious and fairly implicit, and I don't think there's a problem, but when we talk about directions, we often have a habit of using absolute directions, like right side and left side. So when someone who's never used a bow before, and this is seen in his comment section, um, they think that all bows are like this, and therefore you must load from the left side only, even though you're right-handed or left-handed. So uh, just to clarify that for those who are shooting left-handed, all the directions are reversed. Did archers always load the arrow on the right side? Now, if you've seen anything about archery on YouTube, there's a very high chance you've seen a video made by Lars Anderson. Uh, this question might seem a little odd to archers, uh, but to non-archers, it's a pretty fair and legitimate question. And also keep in mind, this is in the uh, aftermath of the Lars Anderson popularity. So I think it's fair to bring it up. There's enough evidence to show that arrows have been loaded on both the right side and the left side in historical archery. True, no argument there. Well, there are both advantages and disadvantages with each technique. This is where I think shadow versity really goes to the unknown territory. Uh, instead of using historical knowledge or practical experience, I think we're using a lot of logic and um, there are quite a few flawed assumptions and conclusions which we'll go through in detail. Which is why historically both techniques were used depending on the preferences of the individual archer. This remark caused a lot of confusion for me initially um, and a lot of people have accused me of misconstruing the point. Now to me the way I understood this was the operative words were uh, individual and preference, which to me, uh, my understanding implies that the person can choose what to do. 
Now, the way it was is that the equipment you had, the materials you had, dictated what you could do. So the choice wasn't something you could actually really make. There was kind of only one way to use the bow. Small variations, but fundamentally the techniques were uniform. So if one particular region had long bows, then um, they used them mostly very similar. Uh, if one particular region used composite bows, then they also used very similar techniques. So an individual uh, Mongol archer might do something different to an individual English bowman, uh, but two individual Mongols wouldn't differ in their techniques. But in regards to modern day shooting, left side loading has become the standard for a very important reason. Uh, Shadowversely will go on to say that it's due to increased accuracy and there are actual big advantages with using the left side for right handed archer. Uh, but the main reason why we see the standardization of modern bow design is because of the lineage of modern archery. Modern archery is most derived from Western European archery. So in the 18th and 19th centuries, long after the bow was used for war, it was maintained as a recreational activity. So uh, there were women and men, upper classes, who were competing in archery using longbows. Uh, these bows would be spread throughout Europe and throughout most of the world, and this was the standard kind of bow used for competitions uh, organized in the Olympic Games in the 1900s uh, and by any world championships. So basically, because the start of sport archery was based in Europe and European archery, um, that was the basis of the development of modern target bows. So all the changes and designs which were geared towards improving accuracy for target shooters would drive this change in shape. Uh, like I said, there are advantages to having the arrow on the same side as you, um, but that's the full background of why this particular style of loading has been used today, and modern bow designs cater to this market. It has higher capacity to render increased accuracy at long distance. It has a high capacity to render increased accuracy at long distance. Basically, uh, be more accurate. So I get what he's saying, tough line, but we'll move on. You're able to look directly down the shaft of the arrow without any obstructions in the way between the, the back of the arrow to the front. Agreed, uh, this is how people intuitively learn how to shoot. Um, the sight picture is unobstructed. Now, can this be overcome if you were to load the arrow on the right side? With practice, yes. But I think this is one of those misunderstandings which stems from not being familiar with uh, Eastern or Asiatic archery. Um, this isn't really a limitation which needs to be overcome because in fact you can sight down the shaft with the arrow on the right side. And this is outlined in historical manuals and treatises. Saracen Archery, for example, uh, has a chapter on aiming uh, and describes the use of the inside of the bow to aim, so along the shaft, um, or the outside of the bow, which is along the edge, or both. In Gao Ying's military archery manual based on the Ming Dynasty, the chapter on estimation states that the true way to aim is to look along the arrow shaft to the arrowhead and trace an imaginary trajectory to the target. Now, Korean archery, which is done at 145 meters, does clearly use the point of the arrow as a reference. In historical Turkish archery, where the shaft might not be used to aim, um, the knuckles can be used to aim. Point being that having the arrow on the right side of the bow shouldn't be seen as a disadvantage, and there are numerous ways to aim with this technique. You always got the issue of the arrow uh, sorry, of the bow being in the way of your shot. This is where I felt that the wrong bow point was most prevalent, but this wasn't very clear in my video. Um, what we're seeing here is the wrong technique of the wrong bow. So it's not really visually showing us what's actually happening. Um, what actually is happening is that because he's using a western recurve of Mediterranean draw, he's trying to keep the arrow on the bow by tilting it this way, which is not how you shoot from the right side. So by doing this and leaning away and moving his head away, um, it doesn't match the narrative he's presenting. And I feel this is not properly representative of the advantages or disadvantages of right side shooting. Now, of course, he might be breezing through the demonstration for the purpose of keeping the video short, but as I said, I feel that by doing all the wrong things at once, um, it doesn't really show a good knowledge of how to shoot this way. 
if you had an Asiatic bow, or at least an ambidextrous bow, and it tried to pull the arrow the correct way, he would actually see that it's quite natural to align the eye with the shaft. So if loading the arrow on the left side has greater potential for accuracy, and pay attention to my words when I say this, has greater potential for accuracy, okay? I think this needs to be qualified to make more sense. Um, are we talking about accuracy as in hitting a long distance target, or are we measuring precision by using points? And while Shad does mention long distance accuracy, do bear in mind that there are many uh, cultures which use the right side and the thumb draw to shoot at very long targets, um, and the standard distance for Korean archery is 145 meters. And not saying that every Korean will shoot and hit a target at this distance, but the really good ones will. I don't disagree with this point. Um, I do think there are many advantages to having the arrow on the left side. I just don't want people to think that the right side or thumb draw is inherently inferior. Ultimately, at these extreme distances, shot execution is more important than aim. As to what was more prevalent, there's no way to tell. All we know is that both left side and right side loading was done. This is one of the strangest statements in the video to me. As far as we can tell, we do know which styles were used. The manuals, the treatises, the writings, the archaeological evidence, combined with appropriate and relevant visual sources, confirm that we know how archers shot based on their region. We can find thumb rings from Nubia to China, so we can infer that people within these regions use the thumb draw, which can really only be done from the right side. And there are exceptions, but historically, for practical shooting, it was only done on the right side for a right-handed archer. Again, quick reminder, if you're shooting left-handed, the directions are reversed. The texts either explicitly say what they did, or they describe techniques which can only work if the equipment is used in a particular way. The English used the Mediterranean draw on the left side of the boat. The uh, Saracen archers in Arabia uh, shot using a thumb draw on the right side of the bow. Both sides were indeed used, but there's no point in trying to determine which style was prevalent because this was distinguished by region. Yet having said that, if loading an arrow on the left side of the bow has greater potential for accuracy on the higher kind of tiers of skill, why did anyone load it on the right side? This is a very broad statement, and I feel that we have to have some kind of measurement to validate this. Um, who are we comparing, and what evidence is there to prove this? In regards to modern day target archery, they always shoot on the left side. So much so, that the standard design of nearly every single bow these days are built to accommodate left side loading. I know Shad probably knows this obvious fact, but he presents this with such authority, uh, with such decisiveness, that I think some of the viewers, in the comments especially, have uh, shown some confusion. Uh, no, not every single bow today is made to be loaded from the left side. There are left-handed bows. So if you're a left-handed shooter or left eye dominant, you would have a left-handed bow and load from the right side. Now, being conservative, uh, I'd say that uh, of the handed bows, about 30% of manufactured bows would be left-handed and loaded from the right side. Uh, there is obviously a right-handed majority, so most bows are right-handed and therefore load on the left side. Again, not trying to misconstrue the point, but just worth clarifying that there are right and left-handed bows. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the speed of reloading. I feel this is where the video really jumps into a logical fallacy. In regards to modern day target archery, you have all the time in the world to load your arrow, set your shot, draw, aim and fire, and then you're under no pressure to reload to take your second shot. Technically, if you're competing, there is a time limit, but it's not a speed thing, so that's not really a negative point. That said, it's important to contextualize how art is being done. If it's done for target or sport or recreation, people generally do take their time, uh, historically and in modern day. But historically, especially if you're using the bow in a combat situation, firing quickly a second and third and as many times as possible is very, very important. Is it really that important though? A speed can be a focus, it can be achieved, 
Um, there are historical manuals, such as, again, Saracen archery, which outline different methods of shower shooting, so holding multiple arrows and shooting very rapidly. But even in the context of Saracen archery, the striking of swiftness or speed is only one pillar. Uh, the other pillars include accuracy, distance, and the infliction of injury. So yes, speed is important in some contexts, uh, but we also need to balance out the other factors of power and accuracy, especially in a military context. And when we think about speed, we also need to assess how fast we would expect an archer to shoot. In other sources, we don't see an emphasis on speed. Uh, the earliest source on English archery, which is Roger Ascam in uh, Toxophilus, um, doesn't really mention anything about speed. He talks a lot about the technique and the skill, but not the speed on which an archer must shoot. Now, later historical perspectives placed the rate of fire at around 10 to 12 shots per minute, depending on who was exaggerating what. Um, Mark Lodes, uh, as a modern estimate, uh, is a much more conservative 6 to 8 shots per minute, which is a fairly relaxed pace. And the problem with assuming speed as being the paramount factor is that it comes at a cost, and this is something which somebody who doesn't do archery might overlook. And this is especially when we get to the military draw weight of 100 pounds or higher. The accumulated fatigue will result in each consecutive shot becoming weaker, less accurate, and more ineffective. In an experiment done by Mark Stretton of the English Warbow Society, he did achieve 10 shots from a 140 pound bow in one minute, but he said he couldn't do 20 in two minutes. Now this isn't saying that speed was not important at all, but we just need to properly manage our expectations and balance speed with other important uh, criteria in archery. Speed was not the main focus of archery. It wasn't the normal focus of archery. And we should also calibrate what we expect speed to look like. Especially if you have some guy trying to charge you with a sword with the intent to kill you. While this may be a throwaway comment, I feel this is a bad representation of historical combat. And this is often used by people to justify speed shooting uh, because you only had so much time before the enemy charged you and killed you. There are actually very few examples of archers being placed in the front line and having to fight and shoot until they're engaged in the melee. Realistically, archers were either support troops or were supported by other troops. So they might open the battle, shoot, and then when the battle entered the melee phase, they would withdraw from the front line and either assist the battle or do something else. And then we have the situations where the archers are engaging other archers. You have, for example, in Cressy, the English archers facing the Genoese crossbowmen. So you're having an archery duel. Uh, then you have the situations where the enemy is not moving. So in the case of the English against the Scots in Falkirk, the Scots were forming stationary shortruns and the English bowmen just shot them. Now, the situation where speed might be really important is if you're being rushed by cavalry, and this was the case in Formigny. That said, the English archers were cut down. When archers did engage enemy infantry, they often had the advantage in being able to shoot them from very long distance, and as they neared, the arrows become more accurate and deadlier. And archers often weren't afraid to engage in melee combat, and this is the case with Ashen Corps. I'm not saying that archers were never charged with infantry, I'm just generally curious what specific event or battle people think of when they imagine this scenario. As an interesting contrast, the archery styles which place more emphasis on speed or speed shooting are societies which are based around horse archery. And this makes sense because you're engaging targets at full speed, therefore you have a limited window of engagement. So it makes more sense uh, for horse archers to learn to shoot very quickly, and it's transferred to their foot archer traditions. But otherwise, shooting as fast as humanly possible was not the normal style of archery, even in warfare. So it wasn't really something which you had to develop an entire style around. Therefore, wanting to knock your arrow quickly, and including the second and consecutive arrows that you're going to shoot, that's a very big priority. Sustained shooting would probably be a bigger priority uh, rather than speed shooting. When you scale up the numbers to that extent, individual speed doesn't matter that much. If we have, say, the 5,000 archers at Crecy shooting at a rapid 10 shots in a minute, 
That's 50,000 arrows flying continuously through the air at an army of perhaps 20,000. And obviously not every arrow will hit and kill somebody, but that's a very high volume without resorting to exceptional speed shooting. An English bowman carried a sheaf of 24 arrows, so even at a fairly relaxed pace, he would run out of arrows in several minutes. So they didn't speed shoot all their arrows and then the battle was over in 10 minutes. It took hours and there was plenty of time between for breaks and lulls to recover, replenish ammunition and come back and shoot. So a battle with archers would be more paced out than what we imagine an action scene to look like. Now, in terms of what enables you to reload or just load in the first place at a fast rate is very much determined in which hand you're holding the bow. At this point, it isn't clear how being left-handed or right-handed changes your loading speed. So if you're holding the bow with your left hand and loading it with your right, this creates some interesting biomechanical issues because the arrow, if it's going to be loaded on the left side, yet the hand you're loading with is on the right side, well, there's something in the way of the arrow that you're trying to load. It's the bow itself. You don't need to load on the left. Now, that particular bow needs to be loaded on the left side. Uh, you don't have to be shooting other styles of archery. And if you're shooting on the right side, then this wouldn't be an obstacle. The very position of your hand on the string is still going to be on the right side, but you need to mount the arrow on the left side of the bow. While this isn't explicitly stated, I do get that he's using a Mediterranean draw on the left side, very specifically. Do you see the problem here? So even after you load your arrow and you have it knocked, guess what side my hand is on? My hand is actually on the left side. So I've got to bring my hand around to the side that I'm drawing with to draw back and then fire. So firstly, this motion isn't as bad as it looks. So we see Shad load the arrow like this and has to hand in the wrong position. So it then has to come around this way. That is a fairly natural motion and you do this instinctively in the blink of an eye. And there are other ways to do this without being so awkward. Um, you can put the arrow down here, move your finger across and then knock the arrow and then you're ready to go. So you can move your fingers on the right side at any point in this process. So this particular loading method is actually not that very common. I feel that we are overemphasizing the clumsiness. Uh, in practice, most of us will shoot like this very naturally without even thinking about it uh, and you can shoot quickly uh, we have in this case kevin hicks he was using a 70 pound longbow uh, and is speed shooting while using the overhand loading method there is a couple of ways to solve this issue if you still want to load the arrow on the left side to get the advantages of being able to line up your shot all the way down the shaft of the arrow there's also the ability to thread the arrow through the bow and knock it over here with the fingers on the correct side. Uh, this is a method used by many archers and can be done quickly as we see in the Hungarian method used by Lars Kashai. And one of the ways to fix this is to mount your quiver on your back. Back quivers is a very contentious topic because people assume back quivers existed. Now, apart from examples from North America and in Africa, there are basically no medieval sources that say back quivers existed. By far the most common way to carry arrows was a hip quiver or a waist quiver or an arrow bag or something along your waist. Um, it is very, very rare to see evidence of a back quiver in medieval times. And this isn't really a solution if it was never used by warriors, especially those who had a reputation for shooting quickly. This is very significant because by having the quiver positioned on my right side, my hand is already there ready to grab the arrows, which is convenient. But after I grab it, I still need to load it on this side. If you hold the knock, lower the bow, and then put it over, it's not as hard as it looks. If you hold your arrow by the shaft, slap it on the wrong side, and then move it over, it does look awkward. I'm not saying Chad is lying. I'm just saying that by using the wrong technique, it makes it look worse. Suddenly, by just angling my bow a little bit this way. Yes, that's how you're meant to hold the bow when knocking. Uh, you can also do this at waist level with the hip quiver. 
Well, as soon as I bring the arrow down, guess which side it's on? It's on the right side it needs to be to be drawn back and shot. Yes, but it's not because of the back quiver. It's because he tilted the bow. That's what you meant to do when loading. Um, when, you have, when you hold it this way, you can generally see and reach things much easier. Uh, before, he was holding the bow upright and slapping on the wrong side and then moving it over. So it looks a lot slower. If you hold the bow normally, you find that regardless of whether you're using a hip or a back quiver, the action of knocking the arrow has no significant speed difference. I forgot to mention a fairly significant advantage to having a quiver mounted on your back, so I'll quickly mention it just here. Notice that once you draw an arrow to loose, the hand that drew the string back is more often than not going to be positioned near your face if you shoot in this style. This means that the position of the hand that needs to draw the next arrow is far closer to arrows that would be mounted in a quiver on your back than opposed to arrows that are hung at your hip. The hand needs to move a shorter distance to draw the next arrow and load it when it's on your back, which facilitates faster reload. I feel that from this point, the video really tunnel visions onto uh, this idea of biomechanical efficiency. Look, it's easy to draw lines on a still graphic and say it's closer, therefore it's faster, but it doesn't really show us the action in motion. So if we fold the graphic, yes, if we shoot and our hand is behind here, I could reach for the next arrow and pull out and knock. Now, is this the most biomechanically efficient method? Well, I disagree. My reasoning is that it feels less efficient to reach over your shoulder and pull something out. Um, that's kind of like reaching for a sword back here. Not as awkward, of course, as a shorter arrow, um, but compared to having things at your hip and putting your hand down and pulling the next arrow, I feel that's easy to manipulate this rather than coming from around the shoulder and doing this. So again, just because my hand is closer to the arrow on release and therefore I can reach the narrow doesn't mean that the whole process is going to be significantly faster than any other method. And again, we shouldn't forget that back quivers were not widely used. More commonly, the arrows were carried in a bag. Uh, it might be in a hip or waist quiver. It might be tucked in the belt. It might be tied in a bundle. It might be stuck in the ground. It might be carried in boots. There were plenty of ways to carry arrows back quivers doesn't seem to be one of them. And the function of a container like a quiver isn't to facilitate fast shooting, it's for portability. It's to allow you to carry the arrows with you. So whatever method or quiver was the most comfortable or the most practical for your situation, whether it's riding a horse or fighting a foot, that's what you use. And the sources largely show us waist quivers or hip quivers. And as we see, there is actually no problem in using a waist quiver or a different carrying method to load the bow. Whether it's pulling it through your belt, pulling it from behind you, or pulling it from a quiver, all these motions were necessary based on what the archer had to carry and had to fight with. And I feel at this point in time that I think we are kind of going down a bit of a fantasy track where we are min-maxing the maximum possible speed through hypothesizing techniques which wouldn't have worked together historically. Because even if you draw the arrow from the quiver and load it, guess which side my hand is still on? Still on the left side, and to draw it, I need to be on this. Not a historical point, but I'm actually curious why Shad doesn't just knock the arrow on the string. He, he mimes all the actions and he holds the arrows in his hand, but he doesn't actually knock the arrow on the string. Um, I'm not sure why. Um, it's right there. He doesn't have to shoot it. Um, the reason why I point this out is that it just helps a lot to actually show the technique um, rather than just talk about it, because um, in doing this, uh, not only do we have a better visual reference, we also come across the limitations that we might not come across or we might overlook. But interestingly enough, there is a technique that solves it, and it's a reverse grip. Instead of drawing the bow back like this, you can switch your grip, make it upside down, and draw it back. And it's this wonderful lady, I don't know her name, I should, probably should do research, but anyway, this wonderful lady here. Have a look how she is loading the bow. What's her grip position on it? So we get to the very well-known uh, Murmunks uh, speed shooting video where the shooter is using the Kinjanaya or the inverted dagger draw. 
So up to this point, uh, the narrative has been quite cohesive. He's established that uh, these things are probably faster, and this is the most natural method to draw and shoot with a bow. And if you mime it, yes, it looks quite good, and in practice it works as well. The problem is that by following this pathway, we've gone very far away from historical archery. For one, this isn't really a historical technique. If it was, it wasn't widespread, not to the extent of the far more common shooting styles. This conclusion is flawed because of all the arbitrary things that were left out along the way. He begins by saying that the left side is more accurate than the right side, so he dismisses all thumb shooting techniques. Um, he says that the uh, left side has a knocking problem, so he ignores all other knocking methods. He then says that, well, the hip quiver is not biomechanically efficient, so he therefore only uses the back quiver. And the fastest way to use a back quiver is to use an inverted draw. Everything that was dropped or left out was historically valid in some way. And what we're left with is a method which would not have been seen or used in history. And all this because we have this fixation on min-maxing speed. And if this is the logical conclusion that this is the fastest hypothetical way of shooting, even this might be disagreeable. So you might think, well, well there you go, that solves the problem. That's why the back quiver was so popular. They weren't. Again, there are very, very few illustrations uh, of back quivers. There's virtually no descriptions in any text and many archers simply didn't have quivers at all. This can be a problem when you're shooting with a very high poundage of bow. Agreed, which is why it wasn't used. So the poundage of bow is actually a very strong indicator or will help you out determine, according to your own preferences, what side of the bow you can load and how fast to reload and other things like that. It doesn't. 100 pound war bows were used for Mediterranean draw on the left side. 100 pound composite bows were shot thumb draw on the right side. Reverse if necessary. If you are dealing with bows of such an extreme level of draw, all right, chances are you are never going to be drawing it with a reverse grip. I feel at this point that we are almost backtracking or subverting the narrative in this video. So we're saying that this is the optimal way to shoot, but it couldn't be done because of war bows, therefore it wouldn't be done. I'm not sure if this is exactly what Shadow is implying, um, but the assumption or the conclusion that an archer could switch styles based on what they needed um, simply probably wouldn't be true. Uh, this would contradict the evidence, which um, states that you basically have to learn the correct technique from the very beginning, and you wouldn't alter your style based on what you felt like. Uh, sources on English archery would say that to use the English longbows or the war bows, from a young age, people had to learn how to shoot correctly by laying into the bow using that particular technique for heavy draw weights. And this is important because by doing this from an early age, you build the right conditioning to use these war bows. And if you did it a different way, you simply would be unable to use the bows that you need to use. But Gao Ying's military manual really goes on a big uh, tirade against any archer who doesn't practice correct techniques at full draw. The Arab archery commentary features several different masters with different opinions, but all reach a general consensus, and they just dismiss any style which isn't theirs. What I would press is that this is a talk on historical archery. If this technique was historical, what evidence do we have that this was widely used? Up to this point, we've chosen several ahistorical forks in the road, and we've reached a logical conclusion on logic which I would question. But the question is, you know, what evidence can we provide that supports that this is a style of shooting used historically? And why this particular style? But there is another method of fast reloading or loading in regards to a bow in which you can use the conventional grip, not reverse grip, conventional. So if you've got using a higher poundage of bow, uh, this technique might be quite useful. And yes, it is loading and shooting the arrow on the right side of the bow shaft. There's pretty much no reliable evidence that the Mediterranean draw was used on the right side of the bow. Now, apparently some people in real life can do so. Um, I don't know, it's a very rare thing to see, if ever. Um, but historically, this was very, very unusual. And the illustrations might show this. 
but the illustrations often come from unreliable sources. Uh, people who weren't there, people who came after the time, uh, people who um, simply didn't know all the technical details. And it's not unusual because even today with access to so many wide sources, artists will still get things wrong. When it comes to loading the arrow on the right side of the shaft, well, you know, you can still have a back quiver and load it that way, but you would need to angle your bow, you know, a bit on this side to load it, which can make aiming rather restrictive and it places the shaft of the bow in your line of sight. We've come back to the earlier point, thumb draw. The right side shooting was done exclusively with the thumb draw and it doesn't hinder aiming. Holding the bow with the wrong grip and using the wrong technique will. So that's why, you know, angling the bow this way is always better because you can line up the shot. This actually is how it worked in some Asiatic styles. Uh, not all Asiatic styles use this. Um, many styles use a straight grip. Uh, Ming archery, for example, does use the angled grip. But if it's on the left side, you might want to do that anyway and uh, aim kind of like this. No one does that. The closest would probably be Ishii, uh, who's a thumb draw. Uh, it's a very unorthodox technique for the people studying him at the time. He made it work quite well. Or you could have the quiver on your hip. Now, interesting thing about that is it's on the right side of your hand, like so where your hand is, so it's already there ready to go. Draw and it's already in the right position to pull back and fire. Yes, that's the normal way to load using a thumb draw. I feel by the way that we are now going backwards. Um, now that we've reached this logical conclusion, we're now exploring other pathways. That's probably what he's trying to do. It wasn't really signposted, but I've now figured out that um, we now actually are exploring proper historical techniques. This is the, one of the things that Lars Anderson points out. Now, the claim that this is how it was always done, no, that's incorrect. The original Lars claim made the mistake of trying to represent archery as historical archery, in which case um, saying that these techniques were used everywhere all the time is indeed misleading. That said, we do have strong evidence to show that in particular regions, these styles were in fact always used, but only in these regions at this time period. So as Chad was saying, these techniques were not always done everywhere. But there are also disadvantages that need to be pointed out. Are on the right side means you can't line up the shaft as easily and so forth. Shooting pinpoint accuracy at hard, far distances, you already have enough limitations in traditional archery, which I'll talk about, and this just adds an additional one on top of that, Yes, you can shoot accurately from the right side. By the way, not all shooting was pinpoint precision aiming. Uh, many styles do encourage instinctive shooting. So, you know, it's not a style you might pick if you're trying to shoot at far distances. But this style was used for long distance shooting. Uh, it's done today in Korea. Targets are 145 meters away. You are still going to need to draw additional arrows from a quiver. And this brings up the advantages and disadvantages of the quiver's positioning. A back quiver will position those arrows closer to the drawing hand and you'd be able to draw out several at a time. But we come back to the point that back quivers are the most efficient or the fastest way to shoot. And again, I do think that the logic behind this is not conclusive and it's at best the same as any other loading style. The thing here is that when we talk about actual speed shooting techniques like the Lars Anderson styles, back quivers are almost never used. What's missing is the data of how the archer needs to grip the arrows in order to load and shoot quickly. Now you can reach one arrow and pull it out, sure, but when we try to do this with multiple arrows, we encounter problems. So if you wanna grab several arrows, you can do that, Sure, a little awkward, but the problem is that you've got the wrong grip. You can't shoot quickly with this kind of grip. Now, if you can figure a method out like inverting your palm and reaching for particular arrows and pulling out like that, you can see that it's actually not as easy as it looks and you can have the arrow set up, but it's quite haphazard, knocks a point in the wrong direction, arrows aren't in the right fingers. Again, I guess with practice you could, but this is like the most uncommon, unconventional way to speed shoot using arrows from the back quiver. And again, the lack of evidence, uh, either from Shad himself doing it or from other shooters performing it, uh, makes this a little hard to substantiate. In contrast, hip quivers offer much more versatility, especially in giving the archer the flexibility in how to set up the arrows in the string hand. 
And in this case, we see Mihai Cosme using a hip quiver and transitioning to grabbing multiple arrows by the knocks. But of course, firing arrows on the more conventional or left side of the bow is biomechanically more efficient when you are drawing arrows from a quiver on your back. As I said before, I feel that this isn't conclusive. The logic states that the hand is closer to the back, therefore it's faster, but mileage will vary. Now, I have another quiver that I used when I was a kid. And of course, it's a back quiver because everyone wanted to be Robin Hood. So yes, I had it on my back and I tell you what, look, it doesn't go to the level of comical awkwardness that Lars Anderson kind of shows in this video, but it is more awkward than having it at your hip, especially when you start to load it up with a lot of arrows. If it's a kid's back quiver, then yes, it's going to be a little awkward to carry lots of arrows. A proper back quiver will be very comfortable. In fact, this is often preferred by many field shooters because you can carry lots of arrows and walk around. Um, otherwise, you have to use a bow mounted quiver or barring that, a field or a hip quiver, which might be a little uh, awkward because it's kind of hanging around and you might jab things with your arrows. I'm not disputing this. Um, it is, you know, a very much a preference thing depending on what you find more comfortable. Uh, but just worth mentioning that the back quivers are not inherently uncomfortable. If speed or of reload isn't nearly as much of an option, or say you're shooting in large volleys with an army, and look, you can load it relatively quick and fire. So if you train and practice, you still can shoot much faster than someone who hasn't practiced, even with a quiver at your hip. So of course, it still can be done. I'm not saying it wasn't. I'm just trying to point out the inherent advantages and disadvantages in these different setups. I think we've come full circle, and now we're back at where we were at the beginning. I feel that in following this video through sequentially, I think we've subverted all these relative pros and cons. I feel that in setting up this discussion, we've jumped to the extremes of accuracy and then speed without qualifying either of them. But along the way, we've proven that in terms of speed and accuracy, the differences between different styles or methods aren't really that important or that great for the historical purposes which they were used for. I will add that the thumb draw methods do have some unique advantages, especially in holding multiple arrows in the string hand and loading quickly, while styles like the English Mediterranean draw are kind of stuck on single shots. That said, there are other thumb draw styles like Korean or Japanese or Chinese archery, which mostly use single shot shooting. So while we have really uh, put an emphasis on speed in this discussion, historically, um, a lot of styles de-emphasize speed. So with that said, we don't really have a global trend, but more of a regional difference. And saying that there was only one style of archery that was ever used historically or one style that was most common or most popular is very incorrect. As well as saying one of these stylistic preferences in archery technique is superior to all other styles. It's a matter of context and the circumstances that the individual archers are facing in the way that they employ archery as a whole. So I agree, there isn't one superior kind of archery. I also agree that archery should not be treated uniformly. It should be defined by context, not as a whole. I feel that we haven't really explored these contexts though. We haven't really mentioned any specific ones. We haven't talked about any specific bows, specific uh, regions, specific armies, specific uses. I feel that by and large, the discussion at this point has been abstract and vague and I don't think we've gleaned much from any specific historical archery. Back quiver, side quiver. Now the first source is the Bayou Tapestry which is a very uh, interesting piece to analyze. Um, the issues here are that the illustrations aren't exactly high quality. We can gain a lot of insight into various things such as uh, the armor they wore, the weapons they wore, the shields and so on. As far as the arrows go, we see um, archers holding it in the bow hand, we see archers carrying uh, belt quivers. There are a couple of quivers which look like back quivers, but the vast majority uh, of the arrows and quivers in this scene, and that's the entire tapestry, are belt quivers. It should also be pointed out that this particular image on the Bayou Tapestry is one of the very, very few visual sources of back quivers in medieval times. The left arrow, right arrow. The third image in this sequence is from the literal sorter, 
uh, it is actually one of only two high quality images which depict English archery. And we do get quite a few things from this picture, including the bows and the clothing, what they practice on and how they shot. That said, this does contain the error of having the arrow on the wrong side and should not be taken to show that yes, this was done. In contrast, the best visual source is the Beauchamp pageant. And this is widely regarded as the most accurate illustration of English archery at its time. Conventional grip. Unfortunately, we come across a different problem. Uh, the illustrations we see here are perhaps far removed from the source material. To quote Clive Bartlett, the majority of illustrations are from foreign artists and foreign workshops. And this picture may be one of those examples which don't really correctly depict archery. Reverse grip. This particular fragment might be showing a pinch draw or a thumb draw. So if you look at it from this angle, that might be what they are doing rather than this. A uh, bit of interpretation there, um, but the pinch draw or the Greek draw was more commonly shown in Greek artwork. I don't think these sources really validate the claim that there is individual preference. And if anything, it shows regional difference. And even then, it's worth pointing out that we have three medieval European sources and one ancient Greek fragment. These are all a matter of individual preference. If we properly contextualize the sources and use a large sample from the same region and time period, we probably would see better patterns. If we have a look at a lot of Japanese artwork or Chinese uh, illustrations or medieval illustrations or uh, illustrations based on the Muslim invasions, we'll see very common patterns. So regardless of what was meant by individual preference, we do see there are very clear trends on how birds were used based on time and place. I'm going to leave the discussion at this point. Uh, the next part of the video covers modern archery, which for the most part, it's not disagreeable. But it's not like a rifle because the other thing about arrows is that they naturally arc and further distance, more of the arc. For the most part. So what are my overall thoughts having looked at this video in far more detail than what I might have done before? I feel that as a video on historical archery and ignoring the modern side for now, it doesn't really talk about historical archery. We don't really see historical technique. We don't see historical equipment. We don't see historical context. What ends up happening throughout the discussion is a train of logic. What I think has happened is that throughout the video, we've gone down this train of thought where we are hypothesizing and using logic to create the ideal min-maxed uh, medieval archer. But in doing so, we are failing to regard historical sources and actually find where these things would have been done. So ultimately, it doesn't present a very accurate look at historical archery in any way. I don't think this was made with the intent to mislead or misrepresent, but the conclusions that were reached may in turn be misleading. And I think overall, in terms of trying to attack the uh, very broad topic of historical archery, We've invariably gone so far from historical archery that these it's almost the antithesis of historical archery. And what I would have liked to have seen is a more specific comparison of different archery styles historically. Uh, if not using source material, then at least using what we generally understand and comparing things together like English and Arabic and Japanese and so on. I think ultimately though, uh, we reach a hypothetical historical archery, not a real historical archery. If you've watched the video up to this point, you might see why. I might feel a little irrational about the way Shadowversity presents historical information. Uh, if you skip to this point, you might be wondering, why am I being such a dick? And I'll, I agree with you. I'll, I'll be purely honest, I, I am being a dick. Uh, I've had a bit of time to think about the things I've been doing and saying, and yeah, it's really gone down a really bad pathway, and there are a lot of things I regret and change in, in hindsight. But no, not, not to um, escalate things, but I want to actually share um, why this uh, has escalated in the way that it has. And, and it's not very fair for Shad, but I also feel that it wasn't fair to me. So I'm going to just kind of very briefly say why things have turned out the way they have. While it may not seem like it right now, I really liked Shadowversity. His content was absolutely amazing. Many of you watching this would definitely agree. He has really awesome content. Um, he's 
definitely one of the premier um, you know, history channels on YouTube, extremely entertaining, very specific topics. And every time something pops up, you just want to watch it and you guarantee it that's going to be good and entertaining. And in honesty, um, I think Shadowversity was my entryway into um, history videos and history content. Um, I would later watch you know, the other big channels like Matt Easton, uh, Metatron, and so on. So I was a very big fan of history already, but finding people like Shadowversity on YouTube really made my day. Like I could really get a lot in, from watching a video, and I would share this with people too, people in real life, people I knew, and I would base a lot of my understanding or my perceptions of medieval history on people like Shad. Now there were some points where I kind of found it a little disagreeable. Uh, for example, um, some of the statements and the attitude shown during the HEMA controversy. But that wasn't something that was long lasting. I didn't have a permanently stained image of Shad because of what he said. And for the most part, it was handled quite well. He reached a good resolution um, and people moved on from there. So when Shadowversity released the Modern vs. Historical Archery video, I was genuinely and honestly excited. This is over a year ago. So uh, I was at the time starting to make a lot of archery content. I was starting to build a reputation. I was really excited to see a major channel like Shadowversity present a topic I was very passionate about. So I was super excited. And I want you to understand that I did not watch this video with the purpose of ripping it apart. I wanted to see from Shad what he had to say about historical archery because this was probably going to be the biggest historical archery video on YouTube. As I watched the video, I became increasingly confused, um, I lost the train of thought and the conclusions didn't make sense to me as an archer. Not as a historian or historical fan or just a viewer, for me it actually does archery. I felt that the statements, the evidence and the conclusions were quite weak. And perhaps I had hyped myself up way too much. I expected a lot of more data from Shad, which might be unfair for him. But I came out honestly feeling dejected and a little frustrated and disappointed that such an important video in, the, in a context which Shad doesn't normally cover didn't fairly represent historical archery the way I knew it. Uh, the best way I can relate this is the feeling many people had when they walked out from watching The Last Jedi. It's the sort of thing you really want to like, but you came out feeling disappointed. And naturally, you want to find a way to convey that in some way. Um, you know, this video is being shared around, uh, there are a few comments that I made on different threads. I didn't comment on the video itself, by the way. Um, I did add a few comments to help people out who were asking questions, but I didn't slander chat in the original video. Um, I actually avoided that. So why did I make the original response video and why was I being so critical? In being exposed to the history side of YouTube, one of the things which I was very curious and interested by was how people were making videos responding and, and critiquing other videos and other channels. Some of these were very critical uh, videos where they're saying everything was wrong and poorly researched and others were more elaborating and correcting and for the most part there was a positive interaction between uh, different YouTubers. And while some of the criticisms were very scathing and basically you have no idea what you're talking about, there was never any bad blood. I felt that the criticisms were healthy, um, it didn't really stir up drama. It was more that this is what I think and this is where you're wrong. And I felt that Shadowversity especially has a very positive track record. He makes many response videos to criticize and critique other videos. And he himself is very proud of his reputation of being open to criticism and respectful disagreement. And in looking through other response videos, that's generally been the case. Um, he's either responded in kind with a video to acknowledge um, some of the points and to clarify others. And in other cases, he writes a comment um, and it's usually done and dusted. So there's no like drag on effect. And people kept on telling me, look, no, Shad will appreciate it. You know, Shadowversity will um, look at your criticism and he'll, he'll think about it. And that's kind of what it uh, motivated me to make the response video. It wasn't to stir up drama and use his name to become popular or whatever. It was to do what basically every other YouTuber and every other commentator, every other fan was doing, to offer some critique or some criticism to extend on what was being presented. Not to shut someone down or to say, don't listen to this guy. Like the video was not insulting. It, I didn't call him an idiot. I didn't insult him personally. Um, I did in the video what um, I was feeling at the time. 
disappointed, dejected, and really um, at the time is appalled by the lack of historical information in a historical archery video. And again, shadow diversity does the same thing to um, like game theory, for example, when I talk about um, uh, For Honor. So there are a lot of generalizations in this video which I felt had to be shot down. And back then, my mindset in making the video was not to become popular, but to add to the discourse like most other people were doing. It's easy to look back at that video and go, wow, you're being a prick. And that's the result of looking in hindsight. When people say this guy's an asshole, this guy's an idiot, watch this video, look how bad he is. In a mind can be made to look bad with the right framing. Uh, I'm not blaming Chad for this, but uh, like I said, hindsight would change the way we see things. Uh, would I do it differently? Yes, I would do it more like this way, more calm, professional, and with the source provided. But my reaction at the time, my mindset at the time was that as someone who does archery, the things that were being said this did not make a single bit of sense for someone who actually does this. Now, of course, I'm no saint either. Uh, I do get things wrong. I do argue with people in my videos and my comments, and people do hate me for it. I accept that. That I, I, I agree that if, you, if I don't look like someone who accepts your opinion, then I don't deserve your respect, and that's completely fine. I understand that. But I really want to underline that this response video was made in the best of intentions. I never assumed that Shadowversity was doing anything bad in his video. I didn't think the video was done to become popular, his video that is. I didn't think it was made to uh, make Arch look bad or to uh, make other people look bad. I thought it was done the way that he always does, to make quality, entertaining videos. That was the best intention that Shad had and that's what I assumed. I assume good faith and what I was doing was to add perspective, to add some commentary, to add some criticism to otherwise good content from a good creator. The thing that really got to me, that made me upset, that triggered me, whatever you call it, wasn't the fact that he used a wrong bow or he talks about English long bows. It was the comment that he posted in response to my video. Now, like I said, I came into this project years ago thinking that He's usually open to criticism. He's usually a very good guy and very calm. But I've never seen anybody, Shad or anybody else, write this 2,000 word response or whatever to a video. It wasn't um, a video response. It was just a written comment. And there was a huge amount of effort. And of course, like you don't normally see essays in YouTube comments. So that was an immediate reaction. was like, well, what's going on here? Like, well, why is it so long? Now, the opening part of the comment does clearly state that he doesn't want to sick his um, fans onto me, and that's a very good foreshadowing of what happened here. So he's completely right there. But the one thing which got to me in this entire comment was a very early statement, and that was he assumed that I was taking everything the wrong way, that I was intentionally misunderstanding, misconstruing, and presenting all the wrong points. And my reaction at the time was, well, what? Why? I, I'm, not, I'm not doing this. I, I, I genuinely don't understand the conclusion that you made. And I, I want to argue that. I want to say that the, the points you made were not based on good evidence, that it was not a good conclusion, and that it was a very poorly thought video. And I have a right to my opinion. I can share that. And did I do it in the most polite manner? No, arguably not. But it was never to make him look bad, but to challenge the content that he was presenting. So many other people were engaged in this same discourse in different topics in different areas. What was different about this video which made Shadowversity react in such a way? And that, honestly, was what stuck with me. My very positive impression of Shad, which at the time had not been shattered at all, was broken down by this one assumption that I was intentionally taking him the wrong way. Now, in my mind, I assumed good faith in Shad. Um, there was no reason, because I wasn't a Shad hater. I wasn't trolling his comments and trying to find out all this dirt about him. I was a fairly neutral fan. And when I watched the content, I was disappointed, so I wanted to add to that. And I was in good faith. I assumed the video was made for all the right reasons, and I made my video in good faith. In return, Shadowversity assumed bad faith, that I was intentionally making him look bad and misrepresenting things. And that, I think, is where the dialogue and the communication completely fell apart. 
Now, I'm not going to argue who shot first or whose fault it is. Um, as of all things, there are uh, two sides to it. Um, and everybody has some part to play in the problem. So, uh, again, I don't blame Shad for this, but that's what happened and why I reacted so badly to it. Um, it was, I felt there was a bit of an injustice where instead of assuming good faith and engaging the conversation, his immediate reaction was to shut me down, put me down, and then say, this is what you were thinking. And that really pushes all the wrong buttons. Um, that was not what I was thinking. But instead of taking my word for it or allowing me to um, engage in this discourse, he just basically said, no, you're wrong. This is what you're thinking. Um, and that's what I felt was present in subsequent um, comments and videos. And it's also, I think, the mentality in his recent video where he's basically telling you what I was doing rather than letting me say what I was doing. Uh, that doesn't matter now, uh, but that's what happened from my end. Now, how does that relate to me being a dick right now? That's how I see Shad now. Um, at the time, I didn't see Shad as a bad guy. With this interaction, I had a negative perception of him. And unfortunately, as I was making more content, more historical videos, the person who I kept on thinking about when it came to um, the stereotype of the misconception was Shadow Versity. And over the months, um, perhaps, and this is absolutely true, I think, um, I've distorted my perception of Shad to uh, vilify him much more than he deserves to be vilified. So as I made other videos covering different topics and misconceptions, these actually represented other people, other sources, other general uh, problems. It just happened to be that Shad, being the thing in my mind, was the person who represents this, and unfairly so. And that's how things came to be right now. And look, uh, I'd, I'd say in hindsight that, yeah, I, I have built up a very irrational obsession with Shadow Versity. Um, and I look back at some of my comments and the things I've been saying on, say, Reddit or Discord, and uh, that's really stuff which has no reason to exist. Um, there's no trigger, no cause. Um, but yeah, just as I was doing what I was doing, I kept on thinking of Shad and uh, what he said to me back then. So... Uh, so I don't blame Shadow Versity for this. Uh, like I said, nobody is uh, at all at fault here. Um, he doesn't deserve um, that uh, specific targeting. Uh, but like I said, it happened the way it happened because of my reaction to a comment which I thought was unfair to me. And more so that it was not what I thought Chad would do. Um, again, he has a very positive uh, reception to most things. And I was just genuinely confused as to why this particular topic, this particular video, triggered such a negative reaction from both sides. Like I said, from the onset, I don't think Shad has done anything that is absolutely wrong. I think that he's been making content for the right reasons. He shares what he loves. He shares his passion for learning. He shares his passion for, uh, for history. And I did the same thing. But when two people who are extremely passionate uh, disagree or have a bad interaction, then that can lead to a lot of bad blood. And unfortunately, that's what I think's happened here. Looking back at the video, oh, it could be put together in a different way and present things more clearly and neutrally. Uh, but I didn't think I did anything that was particularly horrible. Despite the fact that archery has so much diversity, shadowversity seems So if you've watched this far, um, or you've skipped to this point, uh, what's happening? So uh, the two videos, which were called out in the uh, recent Shadow Versity video, uh, will be deleted. Uh, I will unlist them for a week, so those who missed out can see what's actually happened, and then delete them from the channel forever. Um, I did have a point to make, uh, but regards to the intent, um, the videos did not convey the point very well. And most importantly, it didn't fairly represent Shadowversity. Um, that's really not what he said or what he meant. Um, I listened to the feedback and listened to the criticisms. I've reviewed the content and I've evaluated the same thing. Um, it wasn't really a proper setup and a proper way to include Shadowversity or what he said. So those will be completely gone. The original response video, I will unlist. Uh, I'll keep the video there as a record for this video, uh, but this particular video which you're watching is going to be uh, the standing record. So this is, again, the non-emotional, non-biased, um, uh, more 
academic or more practical um, critique of the original video, which I think is a much fair representation. So I didn't summarize anything. Um, I didn't try to uh, misconstrue things. I'm just working with what was said. So I think this is what the video should have been, and this will stay here. Um, this particular comment section will I'll, I'll leave. I'm not going to touch anything. I've been wiping a few comments, which were particularly nasty. I know people who were very passionate about and very angry were, you know, were really getting into it. So um, I initially wiped a lot of the personal insults, a lot of the racist remarks, uh, but I gave up after a while because that's what happens. Uh, but this one I'll leave. I'm not going to really read the comments or touch this. So if you have any uh, lingering um, uh, comments to make, then I'll just leave it here. Otherwise, if there's any critical feedback or points which should be corrected, that's completely welcome as well. Uh, what changed my attitude? wasn't the uh, huge dislike bombs, wasn't the uh, the 10,000 uh, racist comments or hate comments. It was the handful of people. Uh, there were either my subs or my former subs or shared subs who I uh, just wanted to share a balanced point of view. The handful of people, a very large handful, uh, between all the jabs and all the, um, the trolls, um, that actually put forward a paragraph or two kind of explaining what's going on here. And I think that was the biggest part was listening to a well thought out reason that look, basically pull your head in, you know, get off your throne, um, get it out of your ass, that sort of thing. Um, that was what I needed to hear. Um, I think that I have been going through um, a very uh, negative mindset. Um, I think Shadow Versus unfortunately become um, the object of fixation. Uh, so again, I do apologize to Shadow Versity for putting him in this position. Um, that was not my intent and you know the combination of the factors before this has uh, turned to this point here So that's my apology to Shadow Versity and like I said, I'll be removing uh, the videos which I have put in, in the wrong light On my end, I will be making more content in the future. Uh, I'll be covering again the art tree, the history um, I'll be working more positively with other people in the community. I won't be uh, taking jabs at um, other people. I think I'm past that now. Um, I was in a good place. You know, I was growing. I was growing as a channel. I was growing as a community. We we're doing positive things, and uh, yeah, no, this is really not the way to go. Um, I'd rather be building things rather than destroying things. So uh, I think that's what a lot of you wanted to say to me. A lot of you want to hear me say that, and that's absolutely correct. I think I would agree with that overall assessment. So I've reevaluated. Um, I've got a lot of projects coming up, which are very unique opportunities, and there are things which, if you're excited for history or you know, archery, then something you might want to watch. Um, if you think I'm just an evil guy and I don't deserve anything, then that's that's fine. I accept the criticism. Um, I did tickle the uh, dragon's tail, and uh, I did get burned. So that is completely on my end. Um, and again, don't hate Chad. Uh, I think Chad has done the right thing. Um, he's responded in a way which is very normal, and um, I don't, um, I don't uh, have any bad feeling about Chad. I think that um, I've said what I wanted to say. I think he said what he's wanted to say, and I'm ready to wipe everything, um, both literally uh, and figuratively, and move on from here. So no matter you know what side you're on or what you think of the issue, I hope you continue to enjoy what you're doing. Um, enjoy the content being made uh, by anyone you watch and hopefully you you know keep on doing something good in your life so again just thank you for everyone for um, their support and whatever way you thought was supporting um, and again this is the the video to end the um, I guess the, the war whatever you call it so um, anyway uh, thanks for watching guys and hopefully we'll see you around